Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Proteomics Profiling of Post-Translational Modifications in Early Drug Discovery, presented by Dr. Matt Stokes, Dr. Don Kirkpatrick, and Ms. Lillian Fu. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating today's session. Today's webinar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Cell Signaling Technology. For more information on our sponsor, please visit CellSignal.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen and click Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or click on the Answer a Question box and report your problem. Today's presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. We have three presenters for you today. Kicking us off, we have Dr. Matt Stokes, Associate Director of Proteomics at Cell Signaling Technology. Matt currently leads the Proteomics Products and Services Group, providing start-to-finish proteomics solutions for both academic and industry clients. Following Matt will be Dr. Don Kirkpatrick and Ms. Lillian Fu of Genentech. Don is Associate Director and Principal Scientist, Microchemistry, Proteomics, and Lipidomics at Genentech. Don has been a member of the MPL group at Genentech, currently serving as a Principal Scientist and Associate Director of Discovery Proteomics. His group focuses on implementing new technologies to explore cellular proteins and post-translational modifications. Lillian is Senior Scientific Researcher, MPL at Genentech. Lillian joined Genentech in 2003. During her time at Genentech, Lillian has made important contributions to large and small molecule drug development through her, mass, through her use of mass spectrometry, spectrometry proteomics. For more detailed biographies on our speakers, please click on the Speaker Biographies tab at the top of your screen. So without further ado, Dr. Stokes, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of the mass spec-based proteomics we're doing here at Cell Signaling Technology, and most of that involves what we call PTM scan. So PTM scan is just a combination of antibody-based enrichments with mass spec to both identify and quantify post-translationally modified peptides. It's a method that was developed here at CST, and we've been doing it for a long time, over 10 years now. And really the key to success in PTM scan are the antibodies that we're using for that enrichment. So typically when we develop an antibody, we use a single peptide or part of a protein or even a full protein. Here we're showing a phosphopeptide. We raise antibodies against that peptide and then purify and end up with something that's really nice and specific for one given protein site. Well, the antibodies we use for PTM scan are a little bit different. So instead of using a single peptide as our antigen, we're actually using degenerate peptide libraries. So again, here we have a phosphopeptide, we have a phosphoserine in the middle, and an arginine at minus three. And those two residues are fixed and present in every peptide in the library. And then we vary all the amino acids around it. We raise antibodies against that library of peptides. <clears throat> and now what we end up with are antibodies that are really exquisitely specific for that targeted motif, in this case, RXX phospho S, but broadly reactive against a lot of different primary amino acid sequences. So we can do this for phosphorylation motifs. We can also do it for other PTMs, like acetylation, again, using that degenerate peptide library approach. So we then take these specialized antibodies and use them in the method. And it's really pretty flexible with respect to the types of material you can use as input. So we can do PTM scan on cell lines, tissues, plant material, whole organisms, microbial samples, primary cells or sorted cells, even serum or plasma. So one of the first things we do is take that material and digest the peptides. So everything we're doing is at peptide level, not at the level of proteins or protein complexes. 
So we take those peptides, we enrich with one or more of our specialized PTM motif antibodies. We run the mass spec, we get our peptide identifications, and then we do our quantification and data analysis. And we have a bunch of different varieties of PTM scans. So we can look at phosphorylation, and we can look at tyrosine, serine, or threonine. And shown on the left is a Venn diagram. We can do the enrichments using antibodies. We can also use it uh, use uh, metal ions on beads, uh, IMAC enrichment. And one of the interesting things that we've seen and others have seen is that depending on how you enrich with an antibody or with the metal affinity beads, you actually get different and complementary pools of phosphopeptides identified. And this is particularly important for phosphotyrosine. So to get good coverage of the tyrosine phosphoproteome, you really need to be doing the enrichment using an antibody step. Of course, we can go beyond phosphorylation. We can look at sites of ubiquitination or assimilation. And here we use that same degenerate peptide library approach to make an antibody against the diglycine remnant that's left behind when you digest proteins that are ubiquitinated or assimilated. We can look at sites of lysine acetylation and sites of methylation on both lysine and arginine. And for both acetyl and methyl, this is obviously going far beyond just the canonical sites on histone tails. We're identifying thousands and thousands of sites of cellular acetylation or methylation using these methods. We can look at sites of caspase cleavage, so peptides that have that characteristic DEXD motif to look at the apoptotic program. We can look at other lysine acyl modifications like succinylation, propionylation, malinylation, glutarylation. And now we can actually look at signaling pathways. So here the method is the same. You cut to peptides, do an antibody enrichment, and run the mass spec. The only difference are the antibodies that we're using. So instead of using a, say, phosphotyrosine antibody or a acetylysine antibody, what we've actually done is made multiplex cocktails of our site-specific antibodies. And we've designed those cocktails to interrogate specific signaling pathways or protein types like kinases. We do total proteomics. So here there's just no enrichment step. We cut to peptides, clean up those peptides, and run them on the instrument to look at what's happening to protein levels across cells. We do Western blotting. So in cases when it's not clear which PTM or motif antibody you should use for the enrichment, we can take those same antibodies run a series of Western blots and look for changes in band patterns, band intensities. And where you see those changes, that informs you what the best antibody or antibodies would be for the follow-up mass spec analysis. And we call that kind of view. And then once the PTM scan study is complete, we can also do protein-protein interaction network analysis. And we can actually map the quantitative data that we get in PTM scan onto either de novo generated pathways or uh, pre-made canonical pathways. So, as I said at the outset, we've been doing this for a number of years, and one of the things that we do on the website is actually catalog when people have used PTM scan in their work and published. And so this is a list uh, on the left of a few of the publications from 2017. And I have one brief example. This was some work that was done at uh, Cell Signaling Technology a few years ago looking at tyrosine phosphorylation in ovarian cancer. So we profiled a whole bunch of different ovarian samples, and what we found was that in a subset of those, we saw strong phosphorylation of the receptor tyrosine kinase ALK. And we did some follow-up work and identified a novel fusion of ALK with FN1. And importantly, cells carrying that FN1 ALK fusion are very sensitive to chrysotinib. So here we're showing uh, just tumor growth over the course of a week. The green line is the vehicle control, and you see we get growth over the seven days. When we treat with crizotinib, however, you can see that that growth is almost completely abrogated. Similarly, we can look at some western blots, and up in the top right corner, we see strong phosphorylation of that FN1 ALK fusion. And again, that phosphorylation is abrogated by the presence of crizotinib. And so I'm now going to turn it over to my colleagues at Genentech, who will tell you a little bit about some of the fantastic work they've been doing using PTM scan. All right. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today.
Uh, together with Lillian Fu, uh, what I'd like to do today is to tell you about how proteomics profiling of post-translational modification uh, plays out in the context of early drug discovery. So just as one slide of background, uh, both Lillian and I are members of an organization known as GRED, or Genentech Research and Early Development. And our goal uh, is to make fundamental scientific discoveries and then translate those uh, into therapeutics that provide unique benefits for patients. Uh, and these uh, scientific discoveries span the full range of therapeutic areas from oncology and immunology to neurosciences. And we're gonna tell you about the way that we're using mass spectrometry uh, as a technology to impact all of these different areas. Now, when we think about the functions that are going on within cells, one key aspect of understanding that is to understand the dynamics of the proteome, the proteins that are present, the activities that they have, the locations that they're at, as well as the marks or the post-translational modifications that, that lie upon them, because in many cases, these are controlling the function uh, as well as the loca location of those proteins within cells. And ultimately, uh, proteins get turned over uh, by a series of different pathways, some of which we'll tell you about today. Now, the ability to study proteins uh, in the cellular environment, environment has advanced rapidly over the last two decades, in large part due to technology advances, particularly in the area of, of what we call LC-MSMS, or liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. And so in a simplified view, uh, you can imagine that we have a mixture of proteins and we digest those proteins down into an even more complex mixture of peptides. Those pep peptides then get separated by uh, reverse phase li liquid chromatography and introduced to a mass spectrometer through a process known as electrospray ionization. Now, these mass spectrometers can now identify thousands and thousands of these peptides uh, per hour and give us a, a sense of how abundant uh, they are relative to one another. Now, one of the, the significant advances that's been driving this area of research over the last few years is really uh, an increase in our ability to identify and subsequently quantify uh, these individual features or peptides. Um, you can see just within our own group over the last 10 years, we've seen a full 50-fold increase in our ability to identify uh, peptides by this mass spectrometry proteomics approach, owing largely to advances in two main areas, the efficiency of transmitting ions into the instrument and into the detectors, as well as the speed at which the instruments are able to uh, process the ions, identify, quantify uh, the signals that come from them. Now today what we'd like to do is to focus on one particular protein that turns out to be of, of quite a bit of interest, and this is the protein known as ubiquitin. Now ubiquitin is really a, a multifunctional cellular tool in all eukaryotic organism, organisms. In fact, it's highly conserved. 73 of the 76 amino acids are completely variant across all eukaryotes. The ubiquitin pathway control cell division, it controls cell death, and effectively every process in between. In fact, so much so that about 5% of the human genome, or about 1,000 genes, encode for components of the ubiquitin pathway. The ubiquitin pathway is targeted by pathogens. It's dysregulated in cancer and diabetes, inflammation and neurodegeneration. It's really at the intersection of many, uh, both normal biology as well as pathophysiological processes. For our purposes, another thing that's quite important about it is that we believe that ubiquitin serves to mark the active proteome. That is, it's an insight into those proteins that they sell at any moment in time, fields are particularly important, uh, that, are, that might be changing uh, that might be changing their, uh, their function, whether it be their location within the cell, their activity, uh, or their stability. Now, while ubiquitin is, is a protein, it functions in a unique and interesting way, and that is that it's the, it itself is actually a post-translational modification of other proteins. It becomes attached to tar protein targets through the coordinated actions of the E1, E2, and E3 families of enzymes typically on lysine residues, although it can also be attached to other residues, including cysteines and the N-terminus of proteins. Uh, ubiquitin itself has seven lysine residues and an N-terminus, and in fact, each of those can participate in polyubiquitin chains that take on different structural configurations. These different polyubiquitin linkages uh, confer outcomes at the level of the, tar of the target protein, in many cases, uh, degradation by the proteasome, but in, in other cases, changes in, the lo in their subcellular location or the activity that they have uh, with respect to other proteins that they're interacting with. And of course, because so many of these processes need to be dynamically regulated, uh, cells have a whole host of enzymes that are responsible for removing ubiquitin signals and countering ubiquitin-dependent processes, and these are frequently referred to as DOVs or deubiquitinases. Now, when we, when we think of ubiquitin, um, the, the C-terminal portion of ubiquitin is, partic is particularly important. And so I want to focus on that in, 
in this slide here. So when we think about how when we think about how we want to study ubiquitination of we keep popping across slides here. Um, when we think about uh, studying ubiquitination of, of proteins, the key question is where on the substrate or where on the target is ubiquitin attached? And so if we think about this theoretically, uh, a ubiquitinated protein is effectively a branched protein structure. And at the position where ubiquitin is attached to the substrate, you can see this branch really uh, begins with the C-terminal diglycine of the, of the ubiquitin protein. Now, in our traditional workflows, we digest proteins with trypsin, uh, which naturally cuts at the arginine at the minus three position, liberating this diglycine remnant. And it's this remnant uh, that can be effectively captured using the antibodies that were developed at cell signaling technologies. In fact, this uh, ability to enrich GG peptides is really open to the ubiquitin field uh, to the kinds of mechanistic studies that are really important for us to understand uh, its role in cellular processes. Now, one of the first places uh, that we recognize the power of, of using KGG profiling was in a series of studies uh, that we have uh, been working on over the period of years with uh, Damagoy Vushik's group, particularly focused on the IAP family of E3 ubiquitin ligases, initially thinking about CIP1 and 2. And we were looking at those and working on those in large part because we have a, had a nice tool compound, a molecule known as BD6, that's known as an IP, IAP antagonist. Now, this antagonist of the IAPs actually functions in a really interesting way, uh, namely that it's actually an inhibitor by activating. It causes the CIA prote CIAP proteins to ubiquitinate themselves and subsequently get degraded, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. So a question we wanted to ask was, when BB6 activates CIAP, is CIAP the only protein that gets ubiquitinated in response, or are some of the other proteins in its local vicinity also, mo uh, also modified by ubiquitin upon that transient activation? We carried out a KGG experiment uh, uh, following uh, BB6 treatments of five or 20 minutes uh, and carrying, carried along a gemcitabine control for historical purposes. If we look in at the data, this is a, a geyser plot uh, where we're looking at the log two ratio on the x-axis and the p-value on the y-axis of this BB6 treatment relative to control. And in the top right corner, you can see really the key message, that the BB6 uh, stimulated cells showed uh, elevated levels of ubiquitination, very specifically of five proteins. Uh, one of those was CIP1. Another was its cognate interactor, TRAP2. And the other three proteins, EPS15, EPS15 receptor, and intersectin2, are all members of the clathrin-mediated endocytosis pathway, a pathway uh, that you might predict to be involved with downregulating or, or controlling the levels of proteins such as the TNF receptor at the cell surface. Now, when we look in at the, the individual, when we, hmm, when we look at the, in at the individual peptides uh, from each of each of these proteins, there was another interesting, uh, interesting observation that came, and that is uh, that many different sites were being ubiquitinated. We seem to be hopping around slides a little bit. Uh, many different sites were being ubiquitinated, uh, and moreover, that all of these individual sites of ubiquitination uh, seemed to be responding uniformly uh, to the treatment, uh, going up at five minutes, uh, sort of flattening out at 20 minutes, and effectively showing no response in the gemcitabine. And this was a theme that played out across a number of projects during the early years that we were uh, performing these types of studies. Now, uh, the IAP uh, pathway wasn't the only one where we uh, took advantage of KGG profiling. In fact, uh, this technology was uh, quite meaningful in revealing inducible ubiquitination of a number of interesting therapeutic targets, proteins such as MEK1 in the context of uh, MEK and PI3 kinase inhibition, uh, also the, uh, the estrogen receptor in the context of cells uh, that are treated with fulvestrin. In fact, quite often what we'll see is, is proteins within a pathway being inducibly ubiquitinated uh, when other components of the pathway are themselves being modulated. Now, a key question within uh, the ubiquitin field and many of the biology areas that it impacts uh, involves identifying the substrates of E3 ubiquitin ligases and de-ubiquitinating en enzymes. And one area where we've used uh, KGG profiling uh, to great lengths is to understand the substrates of the E3 ligase Parkin as well as the de-ubiquitinase USB30. And this is some work that's been done across a couple of studies uh, in close collaboration with Barish Bingle and others. When we looked in at, at uh, cells where we had uh, Parkin activated 
uh, or where we had Parkin activated in the context of USP30 over expression, uh, what we saw were a cluster of substrates, they're shown in the lower left-hand side, uh, that were uh, inducibly ubiquitinated and where those individual ubiquitination events were removed uh, by the USP30 dub. And what's interesting about all of the ones in red is that they all reside on the outer mitochondrial membrane, uh, exactly the location where we know each of these two uh, proteins to function. Now, I've shown you a whole series of studies that have been carried out in cultured cells, but of course, uh, these types of experiments can be equally well done in tissues under the right circumstances. And for that, I, I want to just uh, show you some data that was collected in a Listeria infection model in wild type and knockout mice. Uh, for purposes of this talk, it doesn't, uh, not so important which uh, of the knockouts it is because they responded equivalently to the infection. Um, but what uh, I'm showing you in the table on the right-hand side are a series of proteins that showed profound increases or decreases in the extent of ubiquitination. In the top section, you can see uh, proteins that are effectively all or none ubiquitinated in the in, uh, in the in hepatocytes that have been infected with Listeria for three days, a cluster of proteins in the ubiquitin pathway, uh, regulars of transcription uh, such as STAT1 and STAT3, as well as two poly ADP ribose polymerases or PARPs. Now, ubiquitination is going on uh, in the basal state in cells all the time, and there are many important targets that are being ubiquitinated as a part of normal function. Proteins in the liver, such as cytochrome P450s, and you can see strikingly in the lower half of the of the table, how uh, certain proteins, such as the P450s and others, uh, have their, induce, have their uh, basal ubiquitination effectively turned off in response to infection uh, in, in ways that are quite interesting with respect to drug development and the role that P450s uh, often have in, in uh, modulating small molecule inhibitors. Now, I wanted to take a deep dive on a couple of projects. Uh, where we've seen some really interesting things, uh, not with respect to uh, ubiquitination of proteins on the whole, but rather where specific sites of ubiquitination turned out to be particularly important for regulating biological processes. And so to start that, I wanted to just uh, give a brief uh, reminder of re uh, program cell death. Now, program cell death happens all the time. It also is an important way uh, that cells uh, respond to uh, infections as well as other uh, pathogenic stimuli. Now, in the context of inducing apoptosis or programmed cell death uh, that's regulated by caspases, for this talk, what I want to do is, uh, is talk about apoptosis that's induced uh, by treating cells with tumor necrosis factor plus the BB6 molecule that I showed you a moment ago, a, com a combination that we'll call TB. Now, this will induce uh, cas caspase activation and lead cells to die through apoptosis unless those cells are treated with the caspase inhibitor ZVAD. Now, what ZVAD does is not prevent cell death altogether, but rather shunts those cells into a new pathway of cell death known as necroptosis. And so uh, for inducing necroptosis, we're gonna uh, refer to those cells as having been uh, treated with TBZ, that is the combination of TNF, BB6, and ZVAD. So just as a reminder, TNF stimulates the tumor, the, the tumor necrosis uh, factor receptor, uh, BB6 uh, functions by inhibiting the IAP E3 ubiquitin ligases, <clears throat> and ZVED functions by blocking caspase activation, ultimately shunting cells into the necroptotic pathway. Now, ubiquitination turns out to be particularly important in, mul in multiple different ways uh, within this particular pathway. And one place where we could see that quite readily uh, was in studying the ubiquitination through uh, ubiquitin linkage-specific antibodies. These are antibodies that were developed here at Genentech originally by Mara Matsumoto and Vishva Dixit. Uh, and these antibodies recognize a number of the different forms of polyubiquitin linkages, including those linked through lysine 11, lysine 48, lysine 63, and what we call the linear chains, or those linked through uh, methionine number one. And if you look on the top left-hand side, uh, you can see that the way, the way that they were used in, uh, in the context of these studies is actually through immunoprecipitation followed by Western blotting, uh, where the proteins uh, in cells that were treated with the TBZ combination uh, were IP'd with one of the linkage-specific antibodies and then Western blotted with the, uh, the substrate itself. And you can see in the context of RIP kinase 1 uh, that there's uh, ubiquitination through lysine 11, but strikingly through lysine 63, as well as this methionine 1 or linear chain. Uh, and to a lesser extent, we can see that same pattern of behavior with proteins such as FLIP and caspase 8. Now, uh, working closely with 
the Vucic group, uh, we carried out a, a really complex experiment looking at each of the different arms of this pathway in cells that were either stimulated with TNF, treated with BV6, the combination of, uh, of T and B, or this TBZ treatment, uh, which should uh, push cells down into the necroptotic pathway. There were many, many proteins that showed interesting patterns of behavior, but I want to focus in on RIP kinase 1, and particularly this site, lysine 115. Now, it turns out that this lysine 115 site lies in the kinase domain, but just outside of the, uh, just outside of the active site. Uh, Donovan's group, group went about making mutants of RIP kinase 1. Uh, this is a, a lysine 115 uh, to arginine mutation. Uh, and there's a couple of really interesting patterns of behavior that we see uh, with proteins that uh, lack this lysine 115 ubiquitin acceptor site. First of those is on the right-hand side. You can see that uh, K115R uh, RIP kinase 1 is, no, is not phosphorylated, uh, as is the comparable wild-type protein uh, shown to its left. And moreover, uh, we fail to see the high molecular weight bands or smearing uh, that's reminiscent of the ubiquitin signal that we're, uh, that we're detecting with the KGG profiling. Now, this, uh, these two uh, events not only exist within whole cell lysate, but also are found in samples uh, that are immunoprecipitated with caspase-8, demonstrating their participation in a, in a larger complex uh, that's controlling the cell death regulatory machinery. Now, where the rubber really hits the road uh, is here, and that is that lysine-115 plays an important role in controlling one of the two uh, cell death pathways. And you can see that uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, in cells that have uh, either wild-type K115R mutant or the kinase dead RIP kinase 1, and are treated with the apoptotic stimulus TB, you can see that each of those different uh, uh, cell groups uh, undergoes cell death through the apoptotic program and shows the decrease in cell survival. That's contrasted dramatically with those cells that are treated with TNF, BV6, and ZVAD, the necroptotic stimulus. Uh, those cells that express wild-type RIP kinase 1 still die, whereas those cells that lack the kinase activity of RIP kinase 1 or the single lysine 115 ubiquitination site are completely refractory to this necroptotic stimulus. Now, the RIP kinase 1 pathway turns out not to be the only place where this pattern of behavior uh, exists. In fact, we had a, a parallel study ongoing uh, looking at two related family members, um, the RIP kinase 2 protein, as well as the E3 ubiquitin ligase known as XIAP. Now, these two proteins function uh, downstream of a receptor known as NOD2, and NOD2 recognizes uh, bacterial peptidoglycan known as muromial dipeptide. Now, the traditional signaling is that muromial NOD2 activation by MDP leads to uh, the generation of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. And so we wanted to understand the crosstalk between RIPK2 and XIAP in the context of, in the context of, uh, of this signaling pathway. So just as I showed you before, linkage-specific antibodies uh, turn out to be particularly informative in this case. You can see uh, IP Western blots performed with uh, the K63 as well as the linear ubiquitin antibodies uh, reveal robust stimulation of ubiquitination on RIP kinase 2 by MDP. Uh, and moreover, that each of these can be inhibited by a compound that's a selective XIP antagonist. This is a molecule known as XB2D89 you see a significant attenuation of the ubiquitination through both of these linkages, as well as an elimination of the, of the phosphorylation on RIP kinase, RIP kinase 2 and downstream targets. So again, the question is, which, uh, which ubiquitination events uh, are induced broadly by uh, MDP stimulation of, of the NOD2 receptor, and which of those can be specifically inhibited by blocking the XIP ligase? And it was here that we got an interesting surprise. Um, on the bottom right-hand side, which you can see uh, is an XY scatter plot of two biological replicates uh, for cells that were treated, basically comparing the 30-minute time point with MDP treatment versus that same treatment in the presence of XIP inhibition. And what we saw were a cluster of ubiquitination sites on RIP kinase 2, but those clusters did not uh, respond similarly. Um, on the bottom left, you can see uh, lysine-376 as a representative example of really the ones in the cluster at the center, a site that was inducible by MDP and that was refractory to XIP inhibition. On the right-hand side, lysine-538 and comparably lysine-410 lie in this lower left-hand quadrant, 
These are sites that are inducibly ubiquitinated in response to MDP stimulation, but are largely attenuated in cells uh, where XIAP is blocked. And that suggested that these uh, two lysines had particularly interesting uh, uh, functional activity. Uh, the Vucha group went on and, and generated a series of mutants, including this K1, K410, K538 double mutant form of RIP kinase 2. Uh, in the western blots on the left, again, you can see attenuated ubiquitination uh, through both K63 and linear chains, and on the bottom right, uh, that RIP kinase 2 is not phosphorylated effectively in the context of this double mutant protein. But most importantly of all, uh, what you can see is that the double mutant K410, K538 uh, uh, protein uh, does not fully rescue uh, the cytokine secretion uh, that's induced by miramil dipeptide in the presence of wild type protein, showing a more than twofold decrease uh, in that uh, in that cytokine release. Now, as we work in the context of of these pathways that control the innate immune system, there is a really important caveat that uh, we should all be aware of when we're thinking about uh, KGG profiling, and it plays out in the context of ubiquitin-like proteins, such as NET8 and ISG15. Now, it turns out ubiquitin and these two uh, family members all have <clears throat> uh, RGG as the last three residues uh, within their sequence, meaning that when they are cut with trypsin, uh, they generate peptides uh, that can be recognized and enriched and captured by this KGG profiling. Now, you can see in the context of the Listeria infection data that I showed you a moment ago, that in fact, ISG15 displays elevated levels of GG peptides on itself uh, in the infection model and suggesting that some of the substrates that are being identified here and potentially in other experiments might also be coming from ISG15. It was with this in mind that we were particularly in, uh, interested in some recent work that came from David Commander's lab, uh, looking at a viral protease uh, that's known to cut, ISG, to cut ISG off of proteins. It turns out that this protease works in a unique and interesting way. Um, it's a protease that recognizes ISG15 and cuts between the arginine at the minus 3 position and this diglycine uh, terminus that's attached to the substrate protein. In fact, leaving the same diglycine remnant that we're fishing out at the peptide level attached to protein substrates uh, that it acts upon. And so with this in mind, uh, the same KGG antibodies that we've been using uh, for our experiments thus far uh, now have a whole host of new uses potentially in studying uh, protein ISG elation in combination with this interesting new, uh, new protease. Now, the idea of, of leveraging, uh, leveraging additional proteases and, and other strategies to study the ubiquitin-like proteins is, in fact, an area of active work in many groups. Uh, we were quite impressed by some of the work uh, that came recently from Betsy Comivas and uh, Eric Bennett down at UC San Diego. Uh, working, clo working closely with colleagues uh, that are part of uh, self-signaling technologies to take advantage of a protease that they discovered down at UCSD uh, known as WALP. And what they, what they found with WALP is that this protease cut adjacent to threonine residues and, in fact, could liberate a, a GG peptide uh, from simulated substrates, making those KGG peptides equally well amenable uh, to KGG enrichment using the technologies that we've been uh, thus far describing and talking about in the context of profiling ubiqu ubiquitination. Now, with all of this in mind, as we start to try to study and understand uh, pathways that are controlled by ubiquitin and other ubiquitin-like proteins, time resolution is really, is really key, that these are dynamic processes uh, working on many proteins in many sites. But in fact, understanding that time domain is, is really important because, of course, if in this simple example I told you that there were uh, three proteins that each changed by twofold at a three-hour time point, the initial uh, assumption might be that these proteins were all being equivalently affected uh, by, a given, uh, by a given stimulus. But of course, there are many ways uh, that these time courses can shape up, uh, and really having the granular, a granular understanding of the time-dependent effects of biological stimuli is really the key to understanding the way that, that proteins are ultimately regulating cellular functions. Now, if we hope to get there, uh, the place that we can see uh, moving is, is toward multiplexing, and there has been some nice work that's been done by Steve Gigi's group, uh, Chris Rose, and others to take advantage of uh, some of the existing multiplexing technologies. Uh, if we want to do this uh, you know, re uh, reproducibly and thoroughly, uh, it'll be ideal for us to come up with ways that we can uh, prepare and analyze these samples in a more efficient way uh, so that we can, you know, bring these technologies truly to bear. And it's with that in mind that I want to hand the mic over to my colleague, Lillian Fu, who's going to tell you about 
uh, the work that we've been doing to automate this KGG PTM scan protocol uh, to really bring uh, the time domain and multiplexing uh, to fruition. Thanks, Don. So as Don uh, has shown you, uh, KGG PTM scan is a commonly employed workflow in our lab, which we've applied to numerous projects. It's a sample handling intensive protocol that takes four days of sample prep before we uh, can inject that sample onto the mass spectrometer. And in our group, the maximum manual uh, capacity is currently eight to 10 samples at any one time in order to maintain uh, reproducibility. Um, and as we are looking toward uh, multiplexing, automation is really something that's gonna help us uh, increase throughput and uh, reduce the amount of uh, hands-on time. Oh. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is an overview of the PTM scan protocol. Um, looking at the steps, there were three uh, steps that were ideally suited for automation, and those were the large-scale C18 set pack peptide purification step, the immune affinity enrichment step, as well as the small scale stage tip cleanup step. And today I'm gonna to tell you about our efforts towards automating the IAP step of the PTM scan protocol. Uh, shown here is the IAP uh, manual protocol. Um, just very briefly, antibody coupled beads are incubated with our digested peptides containing our uh, KGG peptides of interest. Um, the beads are then washed several times to remove non-specific binding prior to elution with acid. You can see it's a fairly straightforward protocol, and you can imagine if we can uh, transfer the antibody um, onto a tip format, um, that would make the protocol really amenable to automation. And the automation platform that we um, settled on uh, was to use Finexus's um, MEA system. It's a great entry-level automation platform. Um, it is a 12-channel benchtop system that uh, offers us the flexibility of working with either a 200 microliter or 1,000 microliter pipette head. It's really streamlined and configurable and allows us to um, work with different plate formats. It's easy to operate. Um, is cold room compatible, which was something that was really important for us as we had steps in the protocol that needed to be performed at four degrees Celsius. And the methods that are developed um, using this platform are transferable to other automation platforms if we end up um, wanting to move uh, over to an even higher throughput system. So the um, early optimization experiments that we performed on the MBA system we're all performed using a simple 3 KGG peptide mix, which we coupled to MALDI MS as our um, quantitative uh, readout. And using this simple platform really enabled us to do quick experiments to select the appropriate tip format that we wanted to move forward with, to also study the effects of temperature on peptide capture, as well as do early experiments investigating the covalent crosslinking of the KGG antibody to protein A resin. And this last point um, I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, once we had optimized some conditions using the simple platform, we moved over to looking at samples that were more representative of real life samples. Um, and to do this quickly, we uh, ended up um, asking uh, members in the group for their uh, leftover lysates. Um, from their experiments, and we ended up pooling these uh, lysates and using that um, as our input um, for the rest of these experiments. And LCMS MS analysis um, for this method development project was all done on our Orbitrap uh, Elite mass spec um, to save precious time on our Lumos uh, systems. So one of the first experiments we did was really a head-to-head -head comparison of the manual method in our hands versus the automated protocol that was developed um, using these um, leftover lysates. And uh, the way that we did this was to go ahead and um, pack CST's antibody preloaded resin um, into TIP format and put that onto the uh, Finexus MEA system. And what I'm showing you here are the results from that experiment. On the left-hand side, um, what you'll see graphed are the number of unique peptide identifications that uh, came out from 
the um, automated sample prep versus the manual sample prep. Um, in blue bars are the number of identifications of KGG peptides, and in red bars are the number of uh, peptide identifications coming from nonspecific um, identifications or non-KGG peptides. And what I hope you can appreciate is that um, we do get similar numbers of uh, KGG peptides identified um, via the manual protocol and the automated protocol. Interestingly, if you look at the non-KGG peptides that are identified, you can see that there is um, a higher number that's uh, identified in the manual, um, manually prepared samples, and that's reflected on the right-hand side um, graph shown where we're plotting KGG over the non-KGG peptide ID ratio. If we go ahead and look at the quantitative data, Coming from these, uh, which are the uh, peptide areas under the curve, you can see again, reflected in the quantitative data, that the automated method and the manual method produce um, similar recovery of KGG peptides. Whereas when you look at the non KGG peptide um, signals, you can see that the manual method does yield a twofold increase in signal. And we really think that um, is reflective of the fact that the automated processing yields more efficient washing, so we're able to more completely remove the uh, liquid from the resin at each step, whereas when we're processing the sample manually, it can be difficult to remove all of the liquid uh, at each step, resulting in some transfer of liquid. So as I've shown you, the manual and the um, automated method uh, yield pretty comparable results, um, but how do they uh, compare in terms of time, reproducibility, and capacity? Um, in terms of time, uh, the automated method um, has resulted in a reduction of about 75% uh, of uh, manual sample handling time, so we've been able to go down from one to one and a half hours down to 15 minutes. Um, in terms of reproducibility, the automated method really uh, allows us to ensure uniformity as all of the samples um, and tips are processed concurrently, whereas in the manual method, we can have a variability in sample handling as we are handling each of the tubes uh, individually and sequentially. In terms of capacity, as I mentioned to you before, um, we're able to uh, process about eight to 10 samples. Um, per one and a half hours hands-on time, whereas in the automated uh, platform, for the same amount of hands-on time, we we're able to process 60 samples. So as a part of um, optimizing uh, options for automated platform, we also evaluated um, the performance of different protein A resins that were available to us. Um, Finexus had two different protein A resins that were uh, available for use um, in their five tip format, which is the protein A, um, the Pro A protein A resin, which features a standard protein A um, uh, protein, and uh, they also offer a protein plus line, which features a recombinant alkali protein A uh, that's coupled to the resin matrix in an orientation for maximal capacity, um, and then. For this study, we also included CST's uh, pre-coupled um, KGG antibody um, to the resin. Um, I wanted to mention here that we, um, for this experiment, we matched the antibody input um, amounts, and that resulted um, in uh, the CST antibody being used at uh, twice the volume as the Pro Plus and the Pro A. Uh, shown here are the results uh, for that experiment, um, looking at the number of unique peptide identifications. What I hope you can see is that we get um, the highest number of uh, KGG peptides identified with the lowest number of non-KGG peptides. Again, that's reflected if you look at the graph on the right showing the KGG uh, over non-KGG peptide ID ratios. And if we look again at the quantitative data, you can see that we do have the highest recovery of KGG peptides with Pro Plus um, with, the, with low nonspecific binding. And so we decided to go ahead and select um, the Pro Plus by tip for our automation platform. As I mentioned earlier, we did um, investigate the use of uh, KGG antibody covalently crosslinked 
Superprotein A resin for our automated um, platform. And this was uh, really in an effort to reduce the amount of antibody that um, is eluded along with the peptides when we're using non-crosslinked antibody. Um, and this antibody that's eluded can uh, interfere with downstream mass spec analysis. Um, in our group, we've observed um, the LC column clogging as well as uh, deterioration of chromatography, which is really important when you're doing um, label-free uh, quantitation that the cr chromatography is consistent from run to run. Uh, additionally, um, many groups in the field have published uh, really highly sensitive uh, protocols incorporating the use of cross-linked antibodies in their detection of KGG uh, peptides. And based on, so based on um, our early experiments uh, with our simple platform, we chose to go ahead um, and utilize EDC sulfur NHS chemistry for our covalent cross-linking experiments. Uh, so EDC is a zero-length carbodiamide crosslinker that in combination with uh, sulfur NHS forms a stable uh, non-reversible amide bond before, uh, between a carboxylate and primary amine group. I'm showing you here the uh, EDC sulfur NHS reaction scheme whereby a carboxylic acid um, is conjugated uh, through an amide bond to a primary amine. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, EDC sulfur NHS cross-linking protocol that uh, we used to um, cross-link our antibody onto the resin. So first, um, we incubated our protein A resin with the antibody, then washed away all the um, unbound antibody, and then incubated with our EDC uh, sulfur NHS reagents. Uh, what I want to point out here is that um, with cross-linking our um, antibody as well as protein A are modified, and we really need to evaluate um, whether or not our antibody epitope is affected um, by introducing uh, this cross-linking. So, of course, we did um, SDS page uh, QC to a that's the cross-linking efficiency, and what I'm showing you here is a gel image um, with um, TFA elutions loaded. You can see um, for the EDC sulfur NHS cross-linked samples, we have very little antibody uh, uh, coming off as compared to the non-cross-linked um, material. And when we go ahead and compare the performance of the non-cross-linked and cross-linked um, uh, antibody resins, uh, what you can see here, uh, again, is that we do get similar um, numbers of KGG peptides that are identified in the cross-linked and non-cross-linked um, antibody resins, uh, but when you go ahead and compare the number of non-KGG peptides that are identified, what you can appreciate is there is an increase um, in the identification of non-specific peptides, which is about a threefold increase. Um, and this was something that we were concerned about since this increase in nonspecific binding can potentially affect the identification of our target KDG peptides by competing for instrument time. Um, so we went ahead to investigate whether or not we could perform a couple of additional um, IAP washes to see whether or not we could reduce the nonspecific binding. And as you can see from the data, the um, amount of nonspecific binding is still uh, comparable uh, to um, the samples where we didn't have the additional washes. So if we go ahead and look at the uh, quantitative data, um, what you can see uh, is that we do observe increased peptide signal for the cross-linked um, antibody resins for both the KGG and uh, non-KGG peptides. And you can see that we see an increase of about one and a half fold, which does not uh, change with the introduction of the extra washes. And this really suggested to us that the modification of the KGG antibody and the protein A with the EDC NHS cross-linking reagent um, affects the peptide binding characteristics. So to conclude, um, hope Don and I have showed you today that we've been uh, able to apply KGG PTM scan to support uh, many small molecule drug development um, 
projects as well as basic research. We've uh, applied this technology, which is, has allowed us to identify inducible ubiquination of therapeutic targets and allowed us to um, reveal direct targets of multiple ligase and dub enzymes. We've also discussed uh, the opportunities um, to repurpose KGG profiling for other ubiquitin-like proteins. And finally, we've shown you how we've uh, transferred the manual PTM scan protocol to an automated platform, which has allowed us to <clears throat> increase throughput and decrease uh, sample handling. And finally, we'd like to um, acknowledge our colleagues in the MPL group uh, for all of their support and thank our many collaborators for the opportunity to present uh, their work today. And with that, I think we can hand it over to the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Stokes, Dr. Kirkpatrick, and Ms. Fu for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A of the portion of the webinar. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question we're gonna to direct to Matt. Matt, can the KGG antibody be used to study sumylation. Are there similar reagents I can use to study sumylation? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Don had some nice slides on this in his part of the talk, but basically if you use an alternative enzyme, alpha-lytic protease, which likes to cleave after, among other residues, uh, threonine, you can generate the same GG remnant and use that same KGG remnant antibody that's used for ubiquitin now to study sumylation. And one of the nice things is that that alpha-lytic protease enzyme actually does not like to cleave at lysines and arginines. So you can really get complementary data. Your sumylation data won't be polluted by uh, ubiquitinated peptides as well. It's really one or the other. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna direct this next question to Don and Lillian. How would one differentiate different protein isoforms that may be present for some proteins in a given pathway? Yeah, that's a really great question. In fact, we see that pattern of behavior all the time uh, when one or more isoforms are expressed within a, a given cell type at any moment in time. We'll often see ubiquitination of both. And I think the way to distinguish them is to look for peptides that are unique to the individual sequences of the two proteins. Um, what we often find uh, for members of a family like that is that, in fact, it's the shared sequences that are themselves modified, uh, presumably because the structural domains are, are shared in common. And in some cases, one can distinguish them by uh, individual amino acid, amino acid variants. And in other cases, uh, the peptides are indistinguishable bet between two isoforms, at which point you can say that one or the other or both uh, of, the two, of the two proteins are modified by ubiquitin. Thanks, Don. I'm gonna hop back over to you, Matt. How much starting material do you need to do a typical PTMS scan assay? Sure, you know, it kind of depends. I would say for any antibody-based enrichment, you're looking at ideally, you know, milligram quantities of total protein input. I will say it kind of varies by the uh, antibody that you're using. So for example, something like phosphotyrosine, where it's more of a rare mod, uh, modification compared to serine threonine, the more material you can get, the better, up to you know 10 to 15 milligrams of protein. Uh, other modifications like acetylysine, uh, we've had really nice data from that down to you know 100 or 200 micrograms of total protein, and you're still seeing hundreds to thousands of, <clears throat> of acetylation sites. I'd also say that there are other options for when uh, quantities of material are really limiting. So total proteomics can take anywhere from 100 micrograms down to just a couple micrograms to get that data. And IMAC, the metal affinity enrichment for serine threonine phosphorylation, a half microgram, five, sorry, uh, 500 micrograms is, um, is plenty for that. Thank you, Matt. And we have time for one more question. Don and Lillian, I'll send this to your way. What software are you using for the label-free quantification? Yeah, so that's an, another good question that comes up quite a bit. Uh, so within our group, we're actually running uh, some in-house software uh, that uh, basically ties together a series of modules 
uh, to perform the various steps in the data analysis process. Uh, with respect to the label-free quantitation, we're taking advantage of a, a piece of software called VistaQuant or CrossQuant uh, that was originally published by Corey Bakalarski and Steve Gigi in a JPR paper uh, back about 10 years ago, and that's been updated to be able to handle the sort of uh, match between runs features that uh, some of the more recent software tools such as MaxQuant do quite well. Um, so there are a number of, way, number of ways to do it, both uh, publicly available tools uh, as well as commercial tools, and the one that we're, we're using is one that we uh, have had here in the lab for a period of time. I'll just add to that briefly that um, we also do a lot of label-free quant, and we've used a few different programs. Uh, we've used Progenesis, uh, Skyline, which is a free piece of software, has worked well for us, and then I know a lot of users out there are using uh, MaxQuant and the MaxQuant Studio to do their label-free quantification. Thank you for those answers. And thank you, Dr. Stokes, Dr. Kirkpatrick, and Ms. Fu for your presentations today. Would any of you like to leave our audience with any final comments? I think I'd just like, this is uh, Matt Stokes, I think I'd just like to again thank everybody for, for joining on today. And um, if anybody has any questions that we didn't get a chance to get to today, we're always happy to talk. You can send an email to ptmscan at cellsignal.com. Uh, or go onto the website. There's a lot of great information on the proteomics page at cellsignal.com. Thank you. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I do see there are a few more questions in the queue, but those questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We'd like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Cell Signaling Technology, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through September 2018. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye now. <laughs>